Ladies and gentlemen, analysts and associates, welcome to your managing director secretary's favorite podcast, The Big Swinging Dex Podcast by Liquidity and Mark Moran. This is not financial advice. You'd be a bottom bucket analyst to make investment decisions based on what is discussed on this show. Welcome back to Big Swinging Dex. Today, we are going to announce who our partnership is with. And I thought the best way to do that would be to just read the press release that just came hot across my desk. What do you think about that? Yeah, that sounds great. It's uh, probably piping hot, right? Carl just forwarded it to me because you know I don't get those business wire emails. But uh, it says, (laughs) and to quote this, it says, CoinFlex and Liquidity create best-in-class partnership to promote awareness and education in the crypto industry. And the select quotes, you know how they do these in these press releases. The select quotes are, highly complementary partnership to accelerate CoinFlex's presence in the U.S. as they formally announce their expansion into the domestic market. In doing so, this will serve to generate awareness, engagement, and further education of the crypto industry via the medium of big swinging decks by liquidity. It's a pretty good one. All right. Wow. Yeah. How many uh, iterations do you think this went through uh, with the MD? You, you know, it's crazy. <laughs> There's like one company that does all the PR. I'm blanking on the name right now. Um, they do like the PR for every deal. Uh, uh, PR Newswire? Or, no, uh, like uh, all like the public releases. I'll, fi- I'll find it later, but it's kind of, that's kind of a fascinating business industry, uh, like a hmm. sub subset. Anyway, anyway, tangent. They say all shareholders are to benefit as education for crypto is promulgated. That's, that's a good word that they put. <laughs> and then it says conference call to discuss transaction via Big Swinging Decks podcast. I think this is the conference call for the, the announcement, actually. So I guess I guess I'll just roll into what the next lines are. So coming to you live from New York City, New York, and Hong Kong, February 15, 2022, Globe Newswire, CoinFlex and Liquidity today announced a definitive podcast sponsorship agreement under which the companies will partner to create America's most competitive podcast industry sponsorship. Together, Liquidity and CoinFlex expect to change the industry for the benefit of their shareholders, bringing more DeFi awareness to traditional finance shareholders in more destinations across the United States. The stronger profile of the partnership will empower it to accelerate investment in innovation and growth and compete even more aggressively, especially against the dominant players. The $1.5 million deal will be split amongst cash, equity, and stablecoin consideration and will be the largest podcast deal ever for new podcasters. When asked about this deal, Lit, the anonymous founder of the meme page Litquidity, said, quote, this deal makes me want to clap cheeks. It's true. I said that. <laughs> Those are pretty good press release, huh? I, I love it. Yeah. And he, what I also love is um, the, the form of consideration. You know, it, it's typically a, all stock or all cash mm. or some creative bankers stock. on this. Yeah. You know, you throw in the stable coins. Uh, pretty soon we're going to say like a, a mix of stock, cash, NFTs, <laughs> shit coins. <laughs> <laughs> but Three it, board apes. The rest of the, and then the rest <laughs> of the consideration is payable in Come Rocket. <laughs> that's the future of money so with that with that little announcement out of the way now that everyone knows it's CoinFlex who we'll be working with do you want to kind of explain a little bit about the background of how this came about and how we came to structure this and set it up yeah that's the perfect uh time to to say this and you know all jokes aside i think people are probably asking why we partner with the crypto company and uh, it's all about you know um really bringing education to the masses um you know our audience is uh typically skeptical about this thing and even just in general right like a lot of people have this view of cryptocurrency being tainted uh, from the, the the shit coins that are out there like dogecoin shibby new uh, doge elon I, like all these things that just really are jokes and and uh some end up being scams and like that just really pisses me off because the more time i've spent over the past year or two researching crypto there's a lot more going on so you know this this helps us further align the views of like hey you know 
Crypto is a $3 trillion asset class nowadays. It's hard to ignore. And we need people to actually pay attention and make sure that they're educated and don't miss out on on something that's really like, you know, grown from nothing to uh, something that's disrupting traditional financial markets. So you don't want to just be that boomer that just really thinks, oh, you know, like uh, the Internet's never going to take off. Uh, so <laughs> that's kind of, I think, where we are at this point in time. Yeah, we're, we're happy to partner with them and that'll uh, help us, you know, uh, tackle some of these topics and even get into a little bit of, of DeFi, Web3, NFTs and like what's actually going on there. Yeah. And I think, too, kind of the cool thing is like we're both at different kind of areas, uh, if you will, of our exposure to DeFi. And so I'd say you're more advanced than I am. And I think it's going to be a good dynamic that we'll be able to kind of walk through these complex areas of focus in kind of different uh, parallel paths where like you can kind of speak to the more experienced people and then me approaching it with the perspective of kind of a five-year-old. Why don't you explain this to me like I'm five? We'll be able to kind of uh, ask questions and help get my base level of understanding. And I think the whole big thing with this is just generating this awareness for the people who are more focused on traditional finance like myself and really being able to kind of see how DeFi fits into this world. So we're not, you know, Bitcoin maxis or anything like that far from that. Uh, but we're people <laughs> who, you know, especially myself kind of want to figure out uh, where does this fit in and kind of in terms of my future portfolio allocation? How can we best use all this information of some of these great guests we're going to be having to, you know, be able to make some returns ourselves and take it from there. So really looking forward to partnering with CoinFlex on this and think it's going to be great for everyone involved. Yeah, for sure. So, you know, in, in today's episode, right, we have a very special guest from the company to uh, help explain a little bit about their platform and also just uh, explain, you know, why they're excited to uh, partner with us as well. Great intro, Lit. Without further ado, let's bring Mark Lamb in. With us today, we have the co-founder and CEO of CoinFlex, Mark Lamb. Mark, welcome. Great to be on here. It's good just to have another Mark here, Lit. How do you feel about two in one room? Yeah, the, the more Marks, the better. It's, it's a great name, and thankfully you don't spell it with a C. That always makes me uncomfortable oh, when God. people do that. Yeah, exactly. The worst. <laughs> I know. Mark Jacobs. <laughs> <laughs> and so we're super fortunate to have you for a multitude of reasons. Notably, this episode is going to serve to announce the expansion of CoinFlex into the U.S., number one, and also for us to officially announce our partnership with you guys for this podcast. So... First off, you know, we really thank you for uh, the belief that you had in us when we first started talking a few months ago, and it's great to be able to be executing this with you now. Yeah, we're really excited to be working with you guys. You know, I think this is uh, this is going to be a huge partnership, a huge, huge deal for us, huge deal for the uh, liquidity audience base, I hope, and the whole community you guys have built. And so we're really excited and we're really big believers in what you guys have done and uh the following you've built, the community you've built, and we're really excited to be announcing the launch of CoinFlex US. Amazing. And, and so that word community that you just touched on, it's interesting because you're someone who has really grown up in the crypto community, uh, you know, really since uh, kind of the onset of it. So we'd love to hear a little bit about your background, what's led you here, and kind of what led you to co-found CoinFlex. Yeah, absolutely. So I was in the UK. Uh, I moved there when I was 18. I started the first Bitcoin exchange in London two years later. And basically, I got interested in Bitcoin when it was at $8. And there was hardly any market for it. And it was a very, uh, very different time. There were, there were really uh, not a lot of exchanges. Most of the exchanges that were around or were facilitating trades back then, basically all of them have shut down. And so it was kind of this market where you really had to struggle for liquidity or liquidity. <laughs> and I was interested in providing that because I, I found that I could buy in Japan and, and then sell in the UK. And so I would, uh, I would buy on Mt. Gox, sell in the UK. And then I realized I could buy and sell in the UK. And then I realized, oh, wow, I'm like 20% of the UK Bitcoin volume and basically decided this was really inefficient to do as a single person collecting pretty huge edge, huge margin on trades. But really, in order to grow the space, we need a proper exchange in the UK. And so I didn't have any background in finance. I didn't have any background in exchanges. 
but I started assembling a team and I started talking to everyone I knew in the finance world. Fortunately, being in London, I was basically surrounded by an expert of exchange folks, trading folks, payments folks, FX folks, et cetera, and could pretty quickly get together an idea of how this how this might work. And so we created CoinFloor, uh, which was the first spot exchange in the UK to offer a uh, trading of Bitcoin. And back in 2017, I started realizing derivatives were going to be much bigger than, than spot. And specifically, I had been talking to some folks at DRW Trading and some folks in the traditional financial world. And, the, and it had been pretty clear to me that physically delivered futures were the way that the futures markets and crypto were going to pan out. And so at first, we started off with this thesis around physical and mm -hmm. we then started looking and building out the customer base on the future side of things. We pretty quickly realized it didn't make sense to do this in the UK. It made more sense to do this as an international offering. It didn't make sense to do this connected to a spot exchange that was focused on one country. And so we, my, my co-founder and I, Sudu, spun out of that business and created CoinFlex. And we launched the first physically delivered futures exchange uh, in Hong Kong. And basically moved out over there and it's just been a process of uh, building and learning and we've changed our thesis several times and kind of evolved it as as we've uh, we've grown with the space and it's it's been a really interesting journey so you mentioned uh, physical you know derivatives could you just take a step back and sort of explain that for the audience that might not know even though our shareholders are very sophisticated yeah so Physical just means that when you deliver, uh, you can you can opt to deliver on a futures contract. And if you deliver, you're getting the other assets. So if you're long a futures contract, let's say it's a Bitcoin future, you deliver, you, you'll get one Bitcoin. So it's basically a way to convert your futures position into spot, whether that's converting into dollars or converting into Bitcoins. And this is something that ties the futures contracts into the spot Bitcoin markets. And what CoinFlex has created is a contract that is both a perpetual, so a lot of uh, people trade perpetual futures in crypto. They're basically futures that never expire, and also mm -hmm. it's deliverable. And the audience of people that want delivery is really around people who care very deeply that the contract can be brought back into spot. Mm -hmm. And what we've realized and what we've tapped into is that the biggest audience of people that care about this is actually an audience that doesn't necessarily care about Bitcoin itself or crypto itself, but actually fixed income and specifically stable coins being the best audience for that. So that was how we created FlexUSD. FlexUSD is basically doing the, it's called the basis trade or the cash and carry trade. It's buying spot, it's selling futures against the spot that it owns. And it's basically taking that to delivery and it's recycling that position a bunch, a bunch of times and it's earning a dollar denominated yield. And so FlexUSD is kind of this token we've created that is both worth $1 and it pays interest while you hold it. Even if you're doing nothing with it, you don't have to stake it or anything. It's just a token in your wallet that pays interest. How is that able to happen for, for those of us who may not understand the interest bearing aspect of a stable coin? Yeah. So the cool thing about Ethereum and many blockchains based on Ethereum is you can actually do a transaction, you can actually create a smart contract where you can do a single transaction call and pay everyone that has a set token or increase the balances in this case of everyone that has a token. So from a smart contract perspective, we were able to create these smart contracts that basically distribute this interest every eight hours. So every eight hours, if you're holding the token in your own wallet, can be on CoinFlex as well, but it could be on your own wallet, separate to CoinFlex. So my my MetaMask, uh, yeah. my Ledger, okay. Exactly. So you can be using MetaMask holding FlexUSD and you just get paid interest. The thing that's cool about this is Tether and USDC pay no interest. So, you, you know, as a, as a creditor, you're lending your dollars to USDC, you're lending your dollars to Tether, and they're paying you nothing. And maybe in a world where federal reserve rates are zero, that's kind of acceptable because you get all this extra utility out of this digital dollar that you can wing around the world on a blockchain really, really fast with cheap fees. But 
once the world starts having actual positive interest rates that are, you know, more than a percent, there becomes really an opportunity cost to holding a stable coin that's yielding zero. And so we're effectively trying to build out the next generation of stable coin where it's actually paying a positive rate of interest. And on average, in the last 12 months, the rates have been double digits. So 10% plus, Mm -hmm. you know, it's a variable rate, it goes up and down. But we've seen, you know, an average of 10% interest rates on on FlexUSD. So I'm making money just holding on to it. Yeah, exactly. So so going going back to that, then the the 10%, you know, or so that that you're saying, I assume it's uh, coming from the basis trade, right? Yeah. I guess with, without getting way too deep into this one, because I know like that could take a whole segment itself uh, to explain. It'd probably go over my head too. <laughs> uh, how would you explain it to someone who is not familiar with the basis trade and how that kind of uh, results in yield that you can pass on to uh, to someone who holds the, the Flex USD? So Flex USD works very similar to a mortgage and CoinFlex works very similar to a mortgage. A lot of people want to buy houses and they want to buy, let's say, a million dollar house or a $250,000 house, but they don't have enough money to buy the whole house. They might have enough money to put down a deposit and then pay interest for the rest. And so that interest rate, that loan is coming from the bank and the bank is effectively financing that house purchase. Well, A lot of people want to do the same thing for crypto. They want to buy $100,000 worth of crypto. They don't have a whole $100,000. They might have half of that. And so what they do is they put down half and then they buy futures. And they're paying interest in the same way that the mortgaged house buyer is paying interest on the, the portion that is borrowed. And they're paying interest on this position that they have. And similarly to a housing mortgage, if if the person who's buying a house stops paying the mortgage payments, the bank has the right to sell the house and recoup the loan. And similarly, in this sense, we as CoinFlex have the right to liquidate the user if they're not meeting margin requirements. So if if you know they put in 50k, they bought a hundred thousand dollars worth of Bitcoin, and then Bitcoin goes down 50%, they will get liquidated sometime slightly before it goes down 50% because their equity and their account will be zero. And so we have a collateralized lending system. Uh, we call it repo. Users don't need to understand you know, the ins and outs, but effectively it is lending to leveraged buyers of crypto in the same way that banks lend to leveraged house buyers. And it's fully collateralized and it's also liquidatable 24-7, 365. So houses might take a month to sell or three months to sell. Crypto takes one second to sell. So it's actually a much safer lending market because the collateral is so liquid and it trades 365, 24 hours a day. And so what you end up having is this market for financing. You know, lots of people want to be levered up on crypto, whether it's a moderate amount of leverage or a completely irresponsible amount of leverage. And the interesting thing that the the opportunity for people is that banks aren't providing these loans. They're not doing this type of financing. So the financing really comes from the non-banking financial institutions. It comes from everyone else. In many ways, it comes from retail investors and institutional investors. And Mm -hmm. the way they can participate in this market is simply by minting FlexUSD. So that's what we're trying Mm -hmm. to make it possible to do is instead of the banks hogging this lending market of houses in crypto, they're not participating at all. And so as a result, the consumer gets to reap the benefits of these leveraged crypto traders by uh, minting FlexUSD effectively. It's very fascinating. And I just wanted to hone in on that one. It's really like when when you think about just like right now you mentioned low interest rates and cash being incredibly cheap and then people wondering well how how can you generate this type of yield or who would lend it out at high rates and i think you know it's stressing the point that the traditional banks aren't participating in this and that kind of leads to you know the opportunity to sort of say hey like we're going to be able to loan this out at a higher rate and then pass off something to the investors like the spread is just that much higher than it is on yeah. traditional banking right uh and so 
just so I understand it correctly, because I've been doing my own kind of uh, under you know research and understanding around this. Um, it's exactly the same way that traditional banks work. It's just the interest rates and the spreads are much higher. Is that correct? Yeah, that's exactly correct. And it's a more peer to peer and direct to consumer market. So, you know, the the way that the banking works, the banking sector works is, you know, consumers are paid a low rate on their deposits. And then the bank is basically taking all the margin in between the rate they pay to the consumer and the rate they collect from the from the housing borrower. And what we're saying is, look, we're going to take 90% and give it to the Flex USD minter. So all of the money, save for a, a small 10%, that is being collected from this lending trade, from this collateralized mm-hmm. lending trade, is actually going to the people who mint Flex USD. And unlike Tether, unlike USDC, which also engage in these types of lending activities, typically not via futures exchanges, because neither of them own a futures exchange or have a futures exchange, but they're doing lending as well. They're, they're buying uh, loan type instruments and they're paying none of that to their holders. We're paying mm-hmm. 90% of it to our holders. Got it. Very cool. So it's safe to say that this is really America's first interest earning stable coin, right? Yeah, absolutely. And and so having this interest that's paid daily, three times daily, right? You're kind of creating this uh, incentive system for people to hold FlexCoin. And my question being that you guys are an exchange, uh, it kind of seems like the opposite incentive to create trading volume. So could you talk a little bit about that in the exchange business? Yeah, so we've really flipped the model where... Traditionally, you have market makers providing liquidity. And traditionally, there's these high frequency trading firms that are doing one of two things. They're either doing the basis trade or they're doing the and providing, you know, providing leverage to people or they're doing market making. And CoinFlex, what we realized and a big part of our thesis around crypto yield 2.0 and also just passive capital and the importance of passive capital is when you look at the universe of capital between hedge funds, family offices, individual investors, traders, mm-hmm. retail traders, etc. There's active traders and active capital, which we define as anyone who's trading many times a day and two, three, mo- hundred thousand, whatever. And then there's passive capital. And that's someone who's deployed their capital into some product or some instrument or some stocks or whatever, crypto, and they're generally not changing their asset allocations every day. They might change it every week, every month, whatever, you know, a few times a year, whatever. Yeah, I'd probably fall under that bucket. Yeah. Yeah. And and you'd fall in that bucket, but actually 99% of the investing world, I would say, falls into that bucket. 99% mm-hmm. of the people in the world are not trading every single day. And most of the capital that's managed in the world you know, people's own capital, but also capital in different investment products is also falling into that bucket. So mm-hmm. even the biggest hedge funds, you know, they're generally not changing their al- asset allocations every single day. And when you think about that, it's very interesting because a lot of the derivatives exchanges are focused on traders. Well, that actually means they're focused on, you know, one or a couple percent of the world which is a small percentage. You know, we're trying to be focused on everyone. So Flex USD is basically saying, look, there's this concept. It's called basis trading and market making of funding markets and, and, and fixed income markets and crypto. We don't think anyone knows how to do this. We don't think retail knows how to do this. We don't think institutional investors particularly want to learn how to do this. We're going to create mm-hmm. a product that's going to make it possible for them to do it without any effort and get all minus 10% mm-hmm. for us, the interest from doing this. And basically, they also get a token that they can use for payments, use for all sorts of things while they're doing this. And mm-hmm. we're going to abstract away all the complexity and give direct market-based yield to the end consumer. And when you think about that, if that product became a $5 billion product, we're pretty sure that we'd be the third or, or second biggest futures exchange. If it became a 10 or $15 billion product, we'd be number one. Mm-hmm. That's simply because you know we'd have so much capacity for leverage and so much capacity for futures position to being opened up at cheap funding rates 
that all the other futures exchanges wouldn't be very competitive. So this is just you know a demonstration of our our thesis around look. Most of the world is not trading futures every day, but they all can provide liquidity into futures, especially if you abstract away all the complexity. Futures are not an end goal for anyone. The end goal is making money from trading, or the end goal is lending or borrowing, or or something you're trying to get out of that derivative contract. The end co- the end goal is not ah I, I'm so cool I'm trading futures. So yeah. people want to get something, and the speculators want to get you know. They want to get leverage. Well, this is going to be the cheapest way to give it to them. The the dollar holders want to get better returns than they can from keeping money in the bank. And this is how we can give it to them as well. Got it. Yeah, that's very helpful. And I think, you know, our audience is very uh, in tune to uh, getting a lot of leverage, right? Like we yeah. talk about leverage to the tits. We talk about, you know, over leveraged and all that good stuff. And so, again, we could be here all day talking about this and it, it's it's very fascinating. But just going back to uh, more so on, you know, the positioning of like CoinFlex, um, you, you mentioned uh, you know, possibility of like being one of the, the largest future exchanges. And uh, that just got me wondering, uh, I've obviously done some research on that, but just curious, like uh, your take on like the competitive landscape as well. You know, I'd say like the first two that I would say, you know, are the, the whales in the room or like the Binance's or FTX's, like how do you operate in that kind of environment? Yeah. So Binance, FTX, OKX will be, and, and Bybit are kind of the, uh, the futures giants. Mm-hmm. In the space today, CoinFlex is uh, is catching up, but we're not there yet. And the thing that's interesting about these companies, they are really all focused on traders. They mm-hmm. are really all focused on the trading element of futures. And we were too. We, you know, we were like, well, you know, traders should prefer physical delivery. And when we started thinking about the reasons why people traded futures, we started breaking it down and realized actually there's a part of derivatives and there's part of trading that has nothing to do with staring at a screen and clicking around or programming an API bot and yourself and using that. And it's mm-hmm. it's that trading is so, it's such a vastly important business to the world that maybe it's come time that the people that are making money on it should be more than just a handful of prop trading firms. Right. You know, many of our share, our you know shareholders and people we're talking to are included in this, but DRW for example and and many firms like them, there's a handful of these and they're making enormous amounts of money from market making, doing basis trades, scalping basis and these types of things. Mm-hmm. But in many cases this is not a complicated science. You know, in some cases, what they do is extremely complicated, but the, the most basic strategies, the most basic parts of this strategy are something that retail can get their head around and something that maybe retail don't even need to get their head around. And the mm-hmm. power of crypto markets, it's, it's, it's very unique. It's the first time in history that in, in financial markets, we've been able to create products that actually tokenize trading strategies and tokenize the returns of those trading strategies into something that can be tradable on a blockchain into something that can be accepted as a stable coin. And so that's how we think about the competitive landscape is, look, FTX are a good exchange, uh, mm-hmm. but they've got cash settled futures. It would be very difficult for them to create a flex USD product because they would have to redo their whole futures architecture and futures contracts and start mm-hmm. from a liquidity base of zero. They don't have a repo market. They don't have any of these things. Binance, largely the same. You know, if, if, if I told investors in CoinFlex, oh, you should invest in CoinFlex because we're going to have more retail traders than Binance. No, mm-hmm. one would, no one would invest in CoinFlex. No one would buy FlexCoin. No one would do any of these things. And we're not telling people mm-hmm. that. We're telling people, look, we can become the fifth biggest stablecoin. And if we become the fifth biggest stablecoin, we're going to be the biggest futures exchange in the world. And that's mm-hmm. because... The stablecoin market cap at that point, we'd have ten billion in flex USD, and that would put right. us at fifth. And and at ten billion, Binance's open interest is less than ten billion. So at ten billion, we'd have more open interest on our futures contracts than Binance. And that's our pitch. That's how we think about the competitors. Is yeah. we're we're not dealing with them head on. We're dealing with them in a totally perpendicular market, which is stablecoins. 
And by mm. by doing decently in that market, we think we can beat the future's competitors. Very interesting. And so that kind of leads me to question. So what is your thesis for the space, for the future of crypto? And how does that relate to CoinFlex? Yeah, so I think crypto is the best money the world's ever seen. And money is an invention. We may use physical objects, whether it's nuggets of gold, pieces of paper, or computer chips to represent that invention. But it's a it's an invention that's particularly odd because it's actually a social invention. It's like a it's like Facebook or a social network or or a, a custom or a ritual. It's a it's a social invention just as much as it is a technological invention. First as a species we landed on gold, then we landed on paper. Now now most of money is electronic. It's just numbers in a database. And most mm-hmm. of the money is numbers in a totally centralized database. And the problem with those centralized databases is they can the, the powers that be the central banks can just add trillions of dollars with one click. And so you've got some guy with root access to the centralized database, and those guys can basically do what they want. And the upside of this database is it's very it can be very efficient and, and it's kind of interesting and creates a global standard. But the downside is inflation and potentially runaway inflation. And so I think crypto is interesting because of its ability to be inflation resistant, because of its ability to be limited in supply and be transportable around the world instantly with with very little effort and very little fees or no fees at all. And so when you think about that, it's it's at some point going to get to the same level of monetary value as fiat. So let's call it $100 trillion. The market cap right now is $1 trillion. It's going to get to $100 trillion if, if we just continue to grow the market of crypto, grow the adoption. Well, in order for it to do that, you do have to have some pretty dramatic pricing increases, especially if the if the, the top players don't end up being Bitcoin, which they might not be Bitcoin. But that type of growth creates trading opportunities, obviously, because anything that's going to change in price that much, you know, there's a real mispricing. And that's what I noticed, you know, in 2012, I kind of did some simple math you know, 70 trillion at the time, less money was around. I thought there was a 1% chance that Bitcoin was going to make it. And at that price, you know, Bitcoin's probably worth $30,000. So 2012, I thought fair value Bitcoin, 30K at at $8 and $10 and $12, I bought as much as I could. Basically, now you have this interesting situation where there's a lot of people who believe in crypto and there's a lot of dollars that are getting invested into crypto, and there will probably be a lot more dollars invested into crypto. But the biggest change, I think, in the next few years is going to be the increase in leverage. There's not enough. There's not nearly enough leverage in crypto. So what do I mean by that? Equities are about 50% levered. So the amount of shares that are borrowed against or, or are bought on margin, plus the amount of derivative contracts that are outstanding uh, related to the S&P 500 and, and specific stocks individually. And so that's about, you add that up, it's about 50% of the market cap of equities. Crypto mm-hmm. is about 1% levered. So there's very, very small amounts of leverage in crypto. And this is partly why the market is so volatile and so inefficient. This is why you have huge down days where it goes down 14%. Because the people that would otherwise say, oh, this move is stupid, I'm just going to buy as much of it as I can, and as a hedge fund, buy a billion dollars worth, in order to do that, they have to put up a billion dollars at an exchange, which they might Mm -hmm. keep on some brokerage platform, and they might not want to deploy all their excess capital or a bunch of their excess capital onto that crypto spot exchange. And if they buy futures contracts, they're paying... 10 to sometimes 20% financing rates to buy futures contracts. And so Mm -hmm. that's one of the big problems in the space. There's not a lot of capacity because if you do expand the, the, the number of contracts, if you do expand the open interest, if you do buy a bunch of these futures contracts and lever up, you'll blow out the funding rates to 20, 30, 50, 100% annualized. And what we're trying to do at CoinFlex using FlexUSD is expand the capacity for crypto to get not from 1% 
leverage, but get that up to two, get that up to five, get that up to 10% of the market cap levered. And, and as a result, volumes will mm-hmm. grow, but also the price fluctuations will be less extreme. There will be less volatility and more liquidity. So th- this is interesting to me because I think you make a very good point with 50% of essentially equities being leveraged. And if it's only 1% uh, here, you know, I think if we were to look at, say, GameStop or AMC, where the price of that fluctuates much more than a traditional equity because you have more retail investors involved, they're getting margin called, things like that, that's creating these swings. For this, you're approaching this from the perspective that leverage is a very good thing in this what is an underdeveloped market. And I think that's something that's interesting because from a traditional viewpoint, from a regulatory viewpoint with you know stereotypical politicians, they're really saying leverage is the enemy here. Leverage is the thing that is what's so scary about the future of cryptocurrency. And you're saying the opposite. Well, you can be a politician and decry leverage all you want, but at the end of the day, it's a little bit silly if you also use a credit card and have a house mortgage. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Everyone uses leverage. Unless you have never taken out any form of loan, never gotten a student loan, never had a house mortgage, never used a credit card, you know, if you're if you're middle class and above in the in in any first world country, chances are you've interacted with leverage a dozen times mm-hmm. in your life, if not several dozen. And you might interact with it in a in a daily or regular basis. It is something that funds the world. It makes economies grow faster than they would have otherwise grown. And if used in a safe way, it's hugely beneficial to the world. Obviously, there are downsides, there are dangers as well. But just because there's dangers with uh, driving a car doesn't mean people don't do it every day. And so Leverage is one of these things. It does get a bad rep, but it's also the most crucial, critical part of the economy. It's it's similarly important to money. Money is half of every single transaction. Well, leverage is what finances, you know, half probably half of those transactions. So Mm -hmm. it's a it's a super important thing. And if you want crypto to mature, you want the volatility to go down. And a lot of people associate leverage with volatility because they think, oh, they see this one move on the chart that was actually driven by someone closing a liquidation. Mm -hmm. And they ignore all the other buys that were and sells that were from responsible amounts of leverage that simply actually made crypto less volatile. And so you can always pick out these examples where, yeah, some liquidation driven move created some sharp volatility. But what about all the other moves? where futures stabilized the price. And so I think that's what some people tend to ignore is if you are in it for consumer protection, and if you are a regulator that's able to see things in a very nuanced way and understand that it's not just black and white, there's there's responsible ways and irresponsible ways to do any kind of business. And a lot of regulators are now seeing that. The beautiful thing about this world that we live in today in, in 2022 is it's very different from before. Before you had different countries calling for complete bans of leverage, you know. And now we have a world where actually a lot of regulators are saying, oh, well, look, there's a responsible level, there's irresponsible levels, there's responsible ways to manage risk, and there's irresponsible ways to manage risk. And so we're really excited about that kind of development in the in the economy. That's one of the most helpful answers I think I've ever heard on that. Yeah, Mark, I mean, you sounding like a (laughs) a complete expert on the space. I mean, if you keep sounding like this, you're probably going to be called upon, uh, you know, to testify in front of in front of Congress. And uh, I'd love to just picture this um, you going against like Brad Sherman, the U.S. representative who uh, was like throwing out mongoose coin and, uh, you know, dog coin and all these other things. And I, I just can't imagine like the the level of sophistication being you know uh, like it'd be like you you know uh, a calculus professor talking to someone who's just barely grasping addition and subtraction but i think i think that's an interesting point though that you make of this let those it's that you have certain people who are very experienced in the space right who understand the potential and the future and then you have a lot of people mostly the people who make the laws who approach it from kind of an antiquated perspective. And it's things like, you know, you, you, it's like what Mark was saying, you can take one data point and create a whole narrative around it and warp a conversation. Like you, you can go testify in front of Congress and they ask you about cum rocket, you know, then that just throws <laughs> and derails the whole conversation to this. Yeah. And, and I think like that, 
you know, going on cum rocket here. Um, <laughs> I, I think a lot of like what has held back crypto is like the attention that's brought into these kind of like shit coins that just don't really add to what's really going on here and, and distracts people and gets them to say, Hey, like, you know, crypto and Bitcoin and all these other things are scams. And, you know, like you can very much so think that, but you're missing the entire point of crypto. And that's what's fascinated me um, over the past couple of years, just like, you know, really diving into it, even though I still, uh, you know, rag on the Bitcoin maxis on Twitter because they're easy to piss off. But yeah, I mean, that's, that's what excites me most. It's, it's just like, there's real economic, you know, fundamental change yep. happening right now. Yeah, it is. It is quite literally changing the world. And what I'd like to point out too, which to me is the most impressive thing you've said in this conversation, is that you bought in at eight dollars in 2011, thinking that the price of Bitcoin would get to around thirty thousand dollars, which I'm checking right now it's thirty six thousand. And so you're kind of the Warren Buffett, uh, you know, not of Omaha, but uh, you could be the Oracle of Dubai. Is that where you're located? I am. I I moved recently to Dubai. And CoinFlex is based in many, many locations around the world. And we're going to be launching uh, CoinFlex US and, and be based in more locations as well. But I'm currently based in Dubai, and I think uh, we'll probably be based here for, for a while. And yeah, I, I moved from Hong Kong, so it's, uh, it's, it's been fun. Mm-hmm. I'll probably be spending time in, in both cities. But, uh, but yeah, I'm, I'm in Dubai right now. Nice. Uh, I mean, that's the perfect place for uh, Lambos and uh you know <laughs> zubrance but uh going back to that 2011 purchase of bitcoin did you ever sell it and like did you pull one of those bitcoin pizza you know uh <laughs> transactions where you'd probably be you know a multi-billionaire if you'd held on no although i i do know the guy who uh sold the pizzas and got the bitcoins from that how, how is he doing these days he's doing great <laughs> 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 yeah, he's uh, he's enjoying life, but yeah, I mean, 2012 was actually two years after I think close to two years after that transaction happened. So, mm-hmm. but I I did sell some bitcoins. I sold some bitcoins to uh, to fund the the founding of Coinfloor. So, I uh, sold sold some of the stack back then and have kept everything I've managed to keep. And you know, I'm still just holding on for the ride. I mean, it's you know. Back then, I thought there was a one percent chance. You know, what's the mm-hmm. what's the likelihood now that it repl- it kind of gets to the same market cap of of money? You know, surely it's higher than one percent. We've come so far. So is it ten percent? Is it twenty percent? I don't know. I mean, ten percent. Uh, its fair value is probably three hundred thousand dollars. So, and again, it might not be Bitcoin. You you you're talking about trolling the Bitcoin maxis. I think they're very easy to troll. And there's lots of problems with the the BTC, you know, Bitcoin. It's got very high transaction fees, similar to Ethereum. Yeah. And and so you know, the beautiful thing about this is it's kind of this market that's proven itself out, but it hasn't necessarily. The end conclusion isn't obvious. I think the end conclusion that one or multiple of these will get to a hundred trillion dollar market cap. That's pretty obvious to me, and I feel like the odds of that happening. Uh, are way higher than when I got in. They're they're probably twenty percent plus now. But yeah. the the chance the the chance that it's it's obvious which one it is, you know, maybe that's less known. And as as an investor, that can be kind of annoying. As a trader or an, as a more passive investor, that can be kind of annoying because it's harder to just click buy and forget it. It's harder to just say, all oh, right, I'm going to buy some BTC. Count on this, you know, replacing you know, yep. traditional money one day and just leave it. And so you have to think a little bit more about which one do I buy? What do I do? What's the community of this going? You know, what what direction are these different communities going in? But at the end of the day, that's what free markets are all about. And that's what free market money is all about. In a free market, you have to be responsible for your own actions, your own investments, your own everything. And so that's really, you know, that's really just the result of this being free market money is you have to think a bit more about what's uh, what's the direction, what's the future. 
Yeah. And, and so you uh, touched upon Ethereum. So like, I wanted to sort of get your sense of the lay of the land, like, or, or maybe more so your portfolio. Like, w- what do you like right now in terms of the layer one blockchains, like Bitcoin or Ethereum, Solana, like just do you hold a little of each? And like, that's kind of, hey, you know, I'm going to spread my bets around. I kind of look at scalability, decentralization, and low fees, and I I look at all of those in combination. And so I think Avalanche has done really well at definitely the the low fees and the scalability. The network I'm probably most interested in is Smart BCH, and Smart BCH is has got a nice mixture of it's decentralized. It's actually based off of the BCH proof of work, which is really the same proof of work. Uh, blockchain and same proof of work hashing power as Bitcoin. So it's a very, mm. very decentralized group of miners. And that's what's powering Smart BCH. It's very scalable. It's built with uh, EVM technology, but it's built in a way that's kind of got 100 times more capacity or 80 times more capacity than Ethereum. And it's obviously low fee. Mm. But the, th- the, the thing that's exciting now is there are a number of these there are L2s as well. There's things that are on top of Ethereum. There's ZK Snarks, which has a bunch of privacy technology. And then obviously there's Solana. And Solana is kind of taking the extreme of low fees and scalable. And then it's it's sacrificing decentralization. So right. yep. the Solana network is very centralized. We've, we've seen evidence of this with the fact that it's been down for 48-hour periods of time. Bitcoin, Ethereum have never had that happen to them. Um, BCH mm-hmm. obviously as well, right? So, so most networks that are sufficiently decentralized have never or really can't really go down for that long a period of time. Maybe, maybe there's problems across the network for an hour or or ten minutes or or a few seconds or something, but it's not going to be a day or it's not going to be ten hours or something like that. But they are pushing the barriers, the boundaries in terms of experimenting on those two scalable right. and low fee. I mean it is it is the most scalable blockchain with more transactions per second than any other chain. So I mm-hmm. like that. I like the fact that we don't know if those those th- the three trifecta of decentralized, scalable and low fee is what makes the most sense. Maybe it's just decentralized, in which case maybe you just want to own bitcoin and you don't care about high fees and low scalability. Maybe you just want something with with maximum decentralization because you believe in the monetary policy, 21 million Bitcoins. Maybe you want the scalability uh, because you think it's all about tech and building this kind of platform dynamic. Maybe you want Avalanche or Smart BCH because you think they're a nice marrying of the three. And maybe you want Ethereum. And so this is kind of the, the tipping point we're at right now with crypto where Ethereum has the majority of the usage in crypto. No one should underestimate the value of that. You know, it's it's probably just by network value, by mm-hmm. far the most valuable coin, by far the most valuable blockchain in crypto, more so than Bitcoin, more so than anything else. So the big question is, are they going to lose that network effect and the value they're in? Or are they going to keep it and upgrade and make these changes? And I've been waiting for, you know, ETH 2.0 and sharding for about five years. So, you know, maybe six yeah, or seven has, at this yeah. point. Yeah. So, <laughs> I, you know, we'll see. Maybe they will. Maybe they won't. Maybe some of these concepts are impossible. But that's that's the kind of tipping point that we're at right now. And it's going to be really interesting to see whether whether that network effect is lost and where it goes if it is lost. I guess one last final question for you then, and this one's uh, very uh, much so just on the personality side and, and not getting deep into the crypto economics and, and uh, whatnot, but what is your Twitter strategy? Because uh, I know like uh, just going back to Binance and SBF, like they are big uh, personalities. Like let's get you up there and get you making some memes, you know, I think that would be. <laughs> yeah. I, I think fun. I need to I need to up my game, you know. I need to I need to make more memes. I need to I need to post more. I need to, you know, maybe be a bit, bit, bit more controversial. But I think the the thing <laughs> that I've when I've when I've scrolled through Twitter and and some of the other social spaces, you know, mm-hmm. one of the things I found to be very successful with different people is just being authentic. And 
I try to do that as much as I, I'm, I think I am quite authentic on podcasts and, and things like this, but perhaps I need to be more just no holds barred on Twitter and, and just go at it. And, you know, that seems to come across really well, being, being funny, being authentic, being yourself, being original. And so, I mean, it's, it's a tough game, you know, Twitter is like a, a total popularity contest. And I, I find myself mm-hmm. like way more interested in just building cool products that people love, but for the, for the <laughs> value of growing those products and getting them out there, it's, it's super important. So yeah, I'm, I'm thinking about making some big changes to that this year and, and, uh, you know, new year, new, uh, new Twitter strategy, right? So that's cool. Well, if you ne- ever need uh, any advice on Twitter strategy, we have the Steve Jobs of shit posting over here. So feel yes, free to reach indeed. out. Yes, yes. <laughs> we will be your outsourced meme manufacturers. Wonderful. That's Wonderful. what we're here to do. Wonderful. Generate a little controversy. Yeah, that's what we got to do. <laughs> Mark, it's been such a pleasure to have you on. This was a super entertaining and informative conversation. Looking forward to doing it again very soon. Thanks so much, guys. This was really, really fun. Flipping the page and moving into our final section, the appendix. Lit, I think we should play Cash or Pass one more time because the shareholders just loved it. And, you know, given that Mark's interview was so crypto focused, why don't uh, why don't we play cash or pass with some crypto focused ideas? What do you think? Oh, I like that. This one will be interesting. Cash or pass. Okay, so, you know, one concept that you uh, have talked about a lot online is uh, a DAO, right? And so recently there was a DAO to buy one of the copies of the U.S. Constitution. So I was thinking, and in my thought, I thought, what about a DAO to buy up B-Bar that famously closed in 2020? (laughs) What do you think about that? I fucking love that. Okay, okay. And and here's why, because it's... It's probably less expensive than the copy of the U.S. Constitution would have gone for. Fair. And it's also easy for people to actually attend or, you know, get value from it, especially Mm -hmm. if they're in New York. So Mm -hmm. uh, there's tangible value. Uh, A lot of people can easily get into it. There's no restrictions. Like, you know, what are 10,000 people going to do with the Constitution copy, right? Just read it. Like, you know, I can do that whenever I want. How many times can I go black out at B-Bar on a Friday or Saturday night with my boys? Exactly. (laughs) That is the ultimate (laughs) utility. I think we've cracked the case here. I think we need to actually launch this. I am very bullish on this one. All Cash. right, let's. Um, so this is a liquidity-driven event. Uh, let's go to the social media accounts after this and uh, see where it goes because uh, I like this idea. But you know, another kind of this is a technical question uh, mm-hmm. that I'd like answered. So if a DAO bought a golf course, mm-hmm. right? How is that any different from a country club? Well, that one is. Uh, I, I, I'm assuming you're going after the Lynx DAO concept. Not, right? not like purposely. I'm just like that's okay. just the most kind of you know. It's like a private club, right? Like, is that any, any really? different well yeah it, it's different because you're not restricting it to uh ultra high net worth individuals uh, which when you think of like a country club, fair it's maybe not ultra high net worth but like the good ones are right yeah 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 but you know i, I think here you're getting a sense of like ownership but it's pretty similar right yeah th- th- there's a lot of intricacies right now around the mm-hmm. buying of the golf course that we can you know probably skip because it'll take a while to explain it but skip yeah, let, let's get that one. So, okay, so the, just to confirm, we're cashing. We're for sure cashing on the DAO to buy B-Bar. Yeah, B-Bar DAO is launching tomorrow. All right, let's do it. Perfect. That's a Mark Moran idea. Thank you, everyone. Let's go do this. <laughs> All right, next idea. So, you know how they recently enabled the uh, touchless pay for the MTA uh, on the subway? Yeah. Kind of got me thinking, what if the MTA just made a stable coin? And, you know, you peg it to the dollar, but then everyone kind of gets that sent to their wallet and you can stake it. So like the more money you got in an MTA account, the longer you can, uh, you know, stake it, make a little bit of money. I don't know. It's kind of like maybe the Miami coin. I don't know any information about that, but what do you think? Yeah. I, for the bus, for the subway, all that shit. That's good. And who, but who would actually hold the coins then? You'd have to have an individual wallet. It would, uh, it would be a play to uh, early uh, for a, a massive city, early scale 
mm-hmm. Bitcoin wallet adoption. This one's buzzwords. interesting. Yeah, but I haven't really fully worked it out. Decentralized. In my head, <laughs> <laughs> okay, yeah, th- this one would be interesting because, well, we should talk to Eric Adams about this. We should. He's getting paid in Bitcoin, so hmm, he could be a good guest for the pod. Yeah, Eric, if you're out there listening to this, uh, open invitation to come on. But I, look, I, I think f- <laughs> for the subway coin or whatever that thing would be called, rat coin. Yeah, I, it could definitely not be on the Ethereum blockchain, just given the gas fees, right? Given like the imagine, gas fees. Yeah, imagine someone who actually rides the <laughs> so subway. Like for 250 but you're paying 156 bucks for a fucking subway ride. Exactly. So, to get yelled at <laughs> by a schizophrenic guy at 2 <laughs> o'clock in the afternoon. Get pushed into the tracks by like some random dude. Yeah, so. our, our first, an yeah. RIP to that. I that Honestly, so just not, not being from the city, my advice to anyone is whenever you're on the platform, to stand by a pole with your back touching something and to if you have airpods in or whatever just be alert so no one can run up behind you and just push you oh yeah i mean i stand right in the middle whenever i go which is you know are you very trying to get killed far in between no no, no. i go to the <laughs> middle like like as far away from yeah, the platform I know, I know. I was joking. Yeah. <laughs> i used to get to the, the platform but scary yeah. situation like i've had multiple friends get like uh you know in rough situations one got mugged the other just wow. got you know slightly robbed but yeah be careful out there if you're in new york city so definitely all right so just to wrap this one up oh yeah are you cashing or passing yeah we're, we're passing on this one. okay all right pass pass yeah. okay so next so seamless creates a their own coin right this the seamless coin seam coin whatever you want to call it right okay and it's only available to investment banking analysts and right restaurants in new york so every day 25 25 dollars is mm-hmm. airdropped to each investment banking analyst in new york's <laughs> wallet okay? okay and then somehow the price changes based on demand and shit like that uh i don't know i haven't thought that far ahead with this idea but they're all getting it at the same time and then they're trying to find the food prices can change everything and there's no taxes that's the best part <laughs> I, I... <laughs> You're going to have to come back to me with a fully baked idea because right now that's a pass. I I, I see it working somehow. Maybe not just seamless, but like with every delivery (laughs) provider out there. But I... Honestly, I have no fucking idea where you're going with this. So. <laughs> yeah, that was kind of one of those ones I was you, you ever start saying an idea and then you hope like more I mean, I do this all the time, uh, and more just comes to you. It kind of just didn't come to me there. So, all right, we're going to pass on that one for now. But now, but I'll say yes. okay, we're yes. going to add a pass but subject to further fleshing out of the idea. Exactly. There's exactly. There. I, I see. There's that. something there. Yeah. We'll have to talk to some developers about it. Some uh some influencers in the web three space. Ooh, okay. Yeah. So next one I was thinking with analysts, because someone tweeted at me the other day and they're like, yo, can you um can you help us get Saturdays off? What if we just like did uh, uh created a union of analysts and made it so that uh ever their their main marketing thing was look like uh workplace dynamics are horrible, we're just gonna all leave our jobs if you don't give us Saturdays off, and everyone did it. Is this the business idea? Well, it's a union, so we'd be getting dues, <laughs> so someone would be getting paid. Yeah, <laughs> I, I pass. I just, yeah, I just wanted to throw that in there. I, I got something. Yeah, I, I don't want to get deep into unions and the politics of that. But hey, my my grandfather was head of the firefighters union in Boston, some big union guy. Okay, I well then I, I I will hold my back in the day. For now. It's a controversial opinion. You know, look like they have done yeah. so much historically. Nowadays, historically. you could take a different opinion. You know, that's all I'm saying. Yeah. Well, I don't want to get canceled. You know, the woke mob comes for everyone. So, look, let's just say that the page has sort of been referred to as a de facto union head, where it's like when analysts are basically going through something tough or Mm -hmm. people want transparency around pay, Mm -hmm. they come to liquidity. You know, union head right there, uh, de facto. But it's, it's ironic because... When you think of uh, Wall Street and capitalism, right, <laughs> you think anti-union and you think, mm-hmm. we'll leave it at that. Got it. Got it. All right. So last one, that is, this is not necessarily a business idea because the money would go to charity, but uh, I, I've been thinking about this since my first day on Wall Street. So you know how JP Morgan has their 5K in the summer? 
Oh yeah, I, like, I've that's seen cool. everyone's yeah, like shirts and bids yeah, that's and... cool and all. But what if we were to create a charity dodgeball competition where it was the bulge brackets versus the boutiques, and you know you have like co-ed teams, single sex teams. We sponsor it. All the money goes to charity, and see mm-hmm. who wins. What kind of charity would you want to? Uh, Probably a mental health one. I think would be a good one. Yeah, that's that's great. I I would support this. Obviously, it's not uh, a cash in the sense of an investment, but hey, I I would totally support this and want to fucking peg someone in the face who deserves it. So, uh, all in the name of charity. Yeah, I yeah, I actually got dodgeball banned <laughs> in my diocese in Catholic school growing up in high school. So uh, I'm definitely down to uh, to go support the cause. But I think if anyone's uh, supportive of that, they should reach out to us. We'll see what we can do. That could be something we do uh, this summer in addition to a few other big things. But Battle of the Banks. Battle of the Banks. It could be good. Love it. I love it. I love it. We'll see. Raise a shit ton of money for charity. It'd be awesome. All that being said, second edition of Cash or Pass. Yeah. Cash or pass. A little bit more realistic ideas. How many did we cash? One. We only cashed <laughs> one. Okay. Um, but <laughs> with that one idea, that's all you need, right? Uh, all you a need. DAO to buy B bar. So let's talk about it online. Let's do it. We'll take it offline, which is actually online here. And we'll then, workshop uh, it terminally we'll workshop. online. Yep. We'll, we'll flesh it out. We'll double click on everything. We'll, we'll put together a nice high level uh, view of this and then. Uh, I think we can execute quickly. Now, don't spin your wheels all night, but do get granular and have it ready for me on my desk by 8 a.m. tomorrow, okay? Cool. I'll ping Carl right now. And with that, Carl's night's getting fucked. Thank you, everyone. See you next week. This has been Big Swinging Decks by Liquidity with your hosts, Lit and Mark Moran. This is a Red Rock Music podcast and is powered by Acast. Our executive producer is Red Yoakum. Our associate producer is Emma Martins. For more, follow us on Instagram at Liquidity and at It's Mark Moran. Or visit the official website, liquidity.co. So tune in weekly to your managing director secretary's favorite podcast. Available wherever you listen to podcasts.